Jim Jordan responds to Alvin Bragg, Manhattan DA, who's prosecuting Donald Trump. And as we've talked about here, Bragg has already responded. So this is actually the third letter in the sequence. Jordan sent a letter over to Alvin Bragg when there was some rumors that a prosecution was going to be coming down the pike. And then Alvin Bragg responded and said, we're not responding to you or, or cooperating at all, really outside of this. You don't have jurisdiction over us. You're the federal government. We're the state government. What are you going to do about it? And so this is Jordan's letter back. This is the third one coming out of the Congress of the United States, March 25th, 2023. And he writes, he says, dear Mr. Bragg, our committees are conducting oversight on your reported effort to indict a former president of the United States and a current declared candidate for that office, Donald Trump. Now, as we read here on March 20th, Congress wrote to you, Bragg, requesting your voluntary cooperation with our oversight, with your documents and your testimony. We sent that letter on that date. And then we received a reply from you and your office, which we also flew through here, which was, I think, a, par a terribly drafted response. It was just basically a bunch of case law copy and pasted and assembled into a big document. But regardless, Bragg replied on March 23rd and set forth several reasons why you could not cooperate with our investigation. And we read that letter here. But Jordan says, you know, very interesting. Your letter did not dispute the central allegations that we have. Firstly, that you, under political pressure from left-wing activists and former prosecutors in your office like Carrie L. Dunney and Mark Pomerantz, both of whom we've talked about here, are reportedly planning to use an alleged campaign finance violation previously declined by prosecutors as a vehicle to extend the statute of limitations on an otherwise misdemeanor offense and indict for the first time ever in history former president of this country. Moreover, you're apparently attempting to upgrade a misdemeanor charge to a felony using an untested legal theory at the same time you're simultaneously downgrading felony charges to misdemeanor in a majority of other cases in your jurisdiction. And this is an interesting thing that I actually looked into a little bit. So what are we trying to do here on the channel? Remember, we've talked about aggravating a misdemeanor out of misdemeanor land and taking it up into felony world, kind of like Disneyland is smaller than felony world, which is Disney world, which is much bigger. So we're taking it from a lower level charge, aggravating it into a higher level charge. DUI example, you get a DUI by yourself. It's a misdemeanor in most cases. If you get a DUI with an eight year old kid in the car, aggravated, turns it into a felony just from that one simple fact change. The one simple fact change in here is really debatable. What is the legal theory for extending the statute of limitations? Even if you look at this and you add in the five-year statute of limitations all the way back. So a couple areas where this can change. One, it depends on sort of the discoverability of the crime. So Alvin Bragg in New York, they would have to make an argument that they just found out about this and they just learned it was kind of a crime. And that means that the statute of limitations only starts at the time of discovery, right? That's one argument they could make. Another argument would be that the statute of limitations was actually told. And they're, they're, they're actually talking about this, saying that when Trump was in the presidential office, that the state statute of limitations was told. Those four years didn't count against the original statute of limitations. They're also saying, right, and that's one theory. And there's also another theory that any time that he was in Florida counts against the statute of limitations. In other words, any time he's outside of the state of New York, would toll the statute of limitations. And again, all of these are sort of untested legal theories. There's no real basis or precedent for that, but they are attempting to finagle a way to get this done. And it seems kind of like a bad thing to do if you're already going to be shattering history with the indictment of a former president and a current political candidate. Contrary to the central argument in your letter, Alvin, this matter does not simply include local or state interests. Rather, the potential criminal indictment of a former president by an elected local prosecutor of an opposing political party and who will face the prospect of re-election implicates substantial federal interests, particularly in a jurisdiction where trial-level judges are popularly elected. 
If state or local prosecutors are able to engage in politically motivated prosecutions of presidents, former or current, for personal acts, this could have serious and profound impact on how presidents choose to exercise their powers while in office. For example, a president could choose to avoid taking action he believes to be in the national interest because it could negatively impact New York City and they could retaliate against him. Similarly, a federal government has a compelling interest in protecting the safety of former and current presidents. And an indictment raises serious issues about that. So now we know we must believe and take legislative action to decide whether these protections are appropriate, and this is critically due to your own actions. You started this. You are now in possession of information that we need to know. Now, this is a little bit more organized than Alvin Bragg's response as we were critical of his response. It was just mostly rules that he copied and pasted and assembled. This one was sent by Jim Jordan, Chairman Brian Steele, Chairman, House Administration, and James Comer. So we've got three different committees here, House Administration, Oversight and Accountability, and the Judiciary. And so this is a much more substantive response than the prior letters. Let's see what's going on here. He says, the arguments in defense of your prosecutorial conduct are conclusory and unconvincing. Says that we have broad and indispensable oversight. You want to copy and paste cases into your brief, we can do it too. Wilkinson versus United States says the following. Broad subject matter areas authorized by Congress. And our committees are authorized to conduct this inquiry, even if you say we're not. In fact, we wrote our own rules in the House of Representatives that allows us to do this, which is great. This is the exact same thing that the Democrats were doing. They sent letters like this to everybody. We can do whatever we want, okay? We're Congress. Supreme Court has said all of this. It's, it's, it's the pendulum swinging the other way. The Committee on the Judiciary has an interest in even-handed application of justice at all levels. He says that your inquiry is on a matter on which legislation could be had, right? Congress can make rules about this stuff, therefore we have jurisdiction over it. Congress has a specific and manifestly important interest in preventing politically motivated prosecutions of current and former presidents. That's why we have broad authority to do this. And your decision to indict a former president causes a confrontation between the Secret Service and your local state. Therefore, we've got to get involved. This is fraught with a collision of federal and local law enforcement officials. And what you're basing this on, which are the campaign finance charges, is inappropriate. It's already been rejected by federal prosecutors. So now we need to bring uniformity to the law. If the feds don't want to run with it and you're causing a conflict between the state and the feds, we have a responsibility now to step in. And your reported decision to indict him also leads us to question the public safety funds that we've been given over to your agency at the New York District Attorney's Office. You're downgrading charges. You're escalating other charges. Maybe we should pull your money back. Maybe we should prioritize our money relative to how you're prioritizing your prosecutions. You've made various requests. The committee has a basis for getting them. Your state law-based defenses are insufficient, Alvin. And your conclusory claim that our constitutional responsibilities will interfere with your law enforcement is unconvincing, saying your invocation of New York laws does not immunize you. Our inquiry does not... In intrude on your state's rights, raising unfounded questions about us being a lawful incursion into New York. He says, no, our oversight does not implicate any anti-commandeering principles and you're just fine. He says, thank you for telling us about your use of federal funds. That's not going to be good enough. And so accordingly, we are reiterating our letter here. We're asking you, Alvin, to comply in full as soon as possible, but no later than March 31st. We trust the information in this letter satisfies your request, Alvin in his prior letter said. Will you let me know if you have any legitimate legislative purpose? He says, we do. Here's eight pages explaining it. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Sincerely, your friend, Jim Jordan, Brian Steele. 
over to Alvin Bragg. And we're asking ourselves what Alvin Bragg is going to do. Is he going to show up? Is he going to respond? Is he going to continue to snub Congress? Is he going to continue to prosecute Donald Trump? We'll see.